Okay, so broad historical context during World War II. Uh, unlike World War I, World War II is actually a much more popular war. It was seen as a necessary war and Americans rallied behind it. And of course, art played a role. The threat of nuclear war by the mid 1940s was a reality and a constant fear. How do you rebound from the atrocities of war? How do you rebound from the Holocaust, from the constant threat of nuclear war, from man's inhumanity towards man? As Barnett Newman said, we felt the moral crisis of a world in shambles, a world destroyed by a great depression and a fierce world war. And it was impossible at that time to paint the kind of paintings that we were doing. Flowers, reclining nudes, and people playing the cello. Cue the abstract expressionists. Here they're posing for Life magazine, and you can see someone added their names. This was not in the original Life photograph, uh, but it's helpful for us to identify all of them. Several of the artists themselves were emigres from Europe, including de Kooning, who came from the Netherlands, Mark Rothko, who came from Latvia, Arshel Gorky, who came from Armenia. Jackson Pollock was from out west, Cody, Wyoming, to be precise. And as a group, they were referred to as the New York School first, later abstract expressionists. Broadly speaking, their work is characterized by non-objective imagery that appeared emotionally charged with personal meaning. The painters fell into two broad groups, those who focused on a gestural application of paint and those who used large areas of color as the basis for their compositions. Pollock's innovative technique of dripping paint on the canvas spread onto the floor of his studio prompted Harold Rosenberg, the critic, to coin the term action painting to describe this type of practice. Color field painting, as the name suggests, consists of large expanses of color, usually kind of flatly painted, as we see in this example by Barnett Newman on the right. Okay, so if we have these two examples, one by Mark Rothko on the left, one by de Kooning on the right, can you tell which is which? Which one is a color field painting and which one is a gestural action painting? How can you tell? Now let's take a look at that painting by Jackson Pollock a little bit closer. This is called Autumn Rhythm number 30. It's from 1950 and it's oil on canvas. And check out the size, it's eight feet by 17 feet. So this is a huge canvas too. So first of all, you may have noticed that it's totally abstract. There's absolutely no recognizable imagery here. There's not meant to be. The idea is that an abstract painting can be universally understood. That's a reoccurring theme that we've talked about in this class already. There's also what we would call an all over composition. There's no one focal point really. Everything is kind of the same um, across. There's, so there's no like hierarchy or anything like that. Our eye is not necessarily meant to go straight to one section of the canvas. As I mentioned before, it's a huge scale. So because it's such a large painting, you can really be, you know, like in the painting when you're looking at it, you can be totally engulfed in the expanse of the canvas when you stand in front of it. And finally, there's an emphasis on the individual. Um, this is a hallmark of abstract expressionism is that each painting reflects the person that made it. So if you zoom in on some of Pollock's work, you can see cigarette butts, you can see washers, you can see nails, see all this other debris that may have fallen in while he was painting. You can also see his handprints um, a kind of mark making that we see in cave painting as if to say, I was here. Um, it's also a kind of primordial or archaic kind of assertion of one's existence. According to the critic Harold Rosenberg, at a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. It becomes more about the performance and the process of creating the painting rather than technical skill and instead it becomes this performative kind of event as he calls it. The general public and most art critics were totally incredulous. They couldn't believe it. Pollock got this spread in Life magazine that asked, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? 
most people would have said absolutely no. And that was kind of the implication by posing the question at the time. Do you think his work is still that provocative today? If you said yes, I think it might help to look at some of Jackson Pollock's influences and see if it helps us better understand where he was coming from and why he made some of those artistic decisions. Jackson Pollock was like a sponge, absorbing influences from many different sources, from American social realism or regionalist art of the 1930s, surrealism and the impact of recent European emigres like Miro on the right, Mexican mural painting, and Native American sand painting. Sand painting was actually featured at the Museum of Modern Art in 1941. Uh, the museum brought in people from the Navajo Nation and had them demonstrate sand painting techniques in front of the visitors, which is what we're looking at on the left there. He was also influenced by surrealist automatism, and we remember that from last week. So that's that kind of automatic drawing style without thinking too much about the end result and just kind of letting your subconscious guide the drawing. So yes, he's influenced by automatism, but beyond that kind of surrealist obsession that's based in Freudian psychoanalysis, he was also interested in Jungian psychoanalysis. Um, Carl Jung talked about tapping into a shared collective unconscious. So not just your own individual um, unconscious or subconscious, but this kind of shared collective unconscious. And Pollock actually underwent Jungian psychoanalysis to treat his alcoholism. And this emphasis on the importance of the individual psyche and the personal quest for wholeness really appealed to him. The idea of the collective unconscious refers to that set of universal forms and symbols. Does that sound familiar? We talked about the utopian aspirations of some avant-garde movements as being interested in creating a universal art as well. Social realism was another influence on Pollock. He studied under Thomas Hart Benton, who was one of the most famous painters of his day. But the WPA context is really important as well. Um, the Federal Art Project, or FAP, operated in all 48 states, and they had divisions for easel painting, mural painting, sculpture, posters, prints, drawings, um, and several abstract expressionist artists were working in that mural division, um, including Jackson Pollock, as well as Stuart Davis and Arshel Gorky. It's said that the Mexican muralists inspired FDR to implement this kind of large scale federal art program as well, based on its success in Mexico. So some of the similarities between Mexican mural painting and what we see developing in abstract expressionism is a connection to scale, huge, huge scale. Uh, you saw that Pollock painting before was 11 feet long, um, as well as political content. Um, even though some of this work is not overtly political, the Mexican muralist, as well as the abstract expressionist artists in America, were all um, pretty Marxist in their leanings. Um, one of the important Mexican muralists is uh, David Alfaro Siquiaros. Whose collective suicide we're looking at on the screen here. Um, Siquiaros created the smaller non-mural works such as this one. This painting depicts a legion of Aztec warriors, which we see on the left over here committing suicide as a form of resistance to the Spanish conquistadors that are over here on the right. Um, represented on horses and led by the lone white figure Hernan Cortez. Um, he created this kind of really interesting backdrop here through experimental techniques, what he called controlled accident of letting highly plastic automobile paints pool together then manipulating them with chemical thinners and commercial airbrushes. The swipes of the airbrush can be seen throughout the painting. He also used a stencil and a spray gun to, to create the Aztec and Spanish figures. As a result, collective suicide stands as an anti-imperialist, anti-war image at the dawn of World War II in Europe. Sicarios had an experimental studio in New York that um, focused on some of those interesting new painting techniques and Jackson Pollock actually attended one of those studios. 
during the talks, C. K. Aros spoke to the need for technological advances in art making. He encouraged his students to use commercial paints, to splatter and throw color, to roughen their paint textures, and to work on canvas tacked onto the floor, which is exactly what Jackson Pollock became known for. Norman Lewis was another abstract expressionist artist, but he's not always included in accounts of the New York school. A lifelong resident of Harlem, an important early influence on him was the sculptor and teacher Augusta Savage, who we saw earlier, who provided him with studio space at her Harlem Community Arts Center. He also participated in the Works Progress Administration, doing art projects alongside Jackson Pollock and others. His early work focused on the experience of African Americans, Besides the separate but equal Jim Crow segregation laws, there was rampant open racism and violence against African Americans. In the late 1940s, Lewis's work became increasingly abstract, as we can see here. His total engagement with abstract expressionism was due partially to his disillusionment with America after his wartime experiences in World War II. He thought it was pretty hypocritical that America was fighting against an enemy whose master race ideology was echoed at home by the fact of a segregated armed forces. Seeing that art does not have the power to change the political state that society was in, he decided that people should develop their aesthetic skills more instead of focusing on political art. If we compare the official portrait of the New York school with the one on the left, we can see that the faulty histories of abstract expressionism leave out not only Norman Lewis, but also the women involved, Janice Biala, Hedda Stern, and Louise Bourgeois, for example. These faulty histories of abstract expressionism also leave out Lee Krasner, who was married to Jackson Pollock, or Elaine de Kooning, who was married to Willem de Kooning. Both were also artists in their own right. So what are the legacies of abstract expressionism? Creation of an arena in which to act. That's both a spatial and a performative aspect. This will lead into the art of the 50s and 60s, into performance art, installation art, and minimalism, as we'll see. All right, so that's all for this week. Um, thank you for tuning in, and I'm going to get back to my pina coladas over here. And sorry, it's so dumb. Um, I'll have to choose a different background next week. Anyways, I hope you're all doing well. Um, take care. Let me know if you have any questions, as always. Have a good week. <laughs>